Hello, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you to today's uh, webinar in the Community Health Considerations Infection Control. Um, I get the honor of welcoming you. My name is Kate Bolter. I am a nurse at Nebraska Medicine and the nurse manager for the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. Um, I've been with NETEC um, since it began and i um, very happy to have this honor to moderate this webinar. Um, this just quick overview of what you're going to be hearing today, um, the welcome, um, of course, by me. Um, then we're going to have Judy Reigert um, give um, community health considerations and infection prevention. Um, we'll then discuss a little bit of NETEC resources, and then we'll get to your questions and answers uh, by our NETEC panel. Um, before we begin, we do like to just give you a little review on NETEC. Um, that, that's especially for people who may be joining us for the first time. Um, so, so we are NETEC. We're the National Ebola Training and Education Center. Um, that's what we were in the beginning. We have now um, changed our name to the, the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. So those of you who may have known us um, in the past uh, will recognize this, that we have a, a new title. Um, NETEC um, is a collaboration between Emory University, Nebraska Medicine, and New York Health and Hospitals um, in Bellevue Hospital in New York. Uh, we have the mission to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. So while Ebola is in her name, um, NETEC is focused on preparing uh, public health and healthcare systems to manage any special pathogen of concern, uh, like this novel coronavirus that we are going to be discussing today. So we apply what we have learned from Ebola preparedness um, to translate it to everyday patient care. Um, so NETEC itself, we have four areas uh, that we work through. Uh, assessment is where we do consultations and on-site assessments um, with facilities. Um, of course, that does require us to be able to travel. So that's been halted a little bit right now. Uh, we provide education uh, through in-person workshops and online um, offerings such as this. Um, our Online resources and virtual assistance can be found at netech.org. And we also support a research network across the 10 regional Ebola and other special pathogen uh, treatment centers. So without any further delay, um, as I said before, I get the pleasure of introducing Judy Reigert, um, who will discuss community health considerations and infection control. So passing it over to you now, Judy, and I look forward to hearing what you're going to tell us. Thank you, Kate, for um, the introduction. And I'm very excited to um, you know, share with the, the community here what we have learned about community health considerations for infection prevention. I'm a registered nurse. I came to the VNA um, about 11, about 10 years ago. Um, and I'm with the role of infection preventionist. I came to VNA with uh, my prior experience in nursing management of ICUs, both medical and surgical, in addition to um, overseeing surgical programs for neuro, orthopedic, and spine. So I came to the VNA with a good understanding of infection control principles from the acute care perspective. What I quickly learned, however, is that Infection control principles and practices are very different in the home and community settings. Just three very brief um, examples. In home care settings, we don't env have environmental service coming through and cleaning the patient's bedroom every day. Secondly, we have to control for pets jumping up on our PPE, cats jumping on our laps, dogs pulling at the PPE, and grandchildren pulling at our PPE. And finally, the universal masking mandate is a very good mandate. mandate. However, in a home-like setting, the patients have a choice whether they wanna wear their mask or not. And we're beginning to see an increasing 
um, number of individuals not wanting to wear their masks during our visits. Visiting Nurse Association of the Midlands is a large not-for-profit community service. We have a home care, hospice, palliative care, acute and high-risk maternal child programs, clinical pharmacy, physical therapy, clinic. We have Easter Cells of Nebraska as a partner who uh, services throughout the state of Nebraska. We have a large school nurse program. We provide the nursing programs in all of our homeless shelters in Omaha and Council Bluffs. And we have a large flu vaccine program. Uh, we serve both uh, the Omaha areas and uh, Southwest Iowa. VNA was founded in 1896 by a very inspiring woman named um, Anna Millard Rogers. She started a VNA of the Midlands as a public health initiative. Um, there was a lot of immigration at that time from other um, communities, other countries, and there were a lot of um, poor sanitation. There was no sewer system, no garbage system, and families really needed help. So she really started the program as a community health program to teach families how to live a healthy life and stay healthy. Um, throughout the years, the next 124 years, VNA continued to grow and develop their infection control practices through epidemics such like as the polio epidemic, the Spanish influenza, TB outbreaks, H1N1, HIV and AIDS. And this really helped prepare VNA of the Midlands, get us ready for COVID-19. In the year 2000, the VNA leadership recognized we really need medical expertise if we are really gonna help support the safety and infection control standards for our community members. We joined with Nebraska Medicine Infectious Disease and Dr. Phil Smith was our first medical director. Dr. Angela Hewlett joined um, soon after that. And as Kate mentioned, they were also directors of the biocontainment unit. So we love to hear their stories and we were taught a considerable amount of valuable information. These medical directors helped to shape policies and practices in the home setting. What they really helped us do was convert acute care policies and practices into the home care setting and help to really to develop an overall community health infection control plan. In addition, they provided input to emerging infections and added that to our emergency preparedness plan. So we um, are grateful to these medical directors for providing that valuable information to get us prepared. We care for patients in homes, facilities, multi-generational, multi-family homes. We straddle all diverse communities throughout Omaha and Southwest Iowa. Some of the key functions of that medical director has to been to advise on aspects of care and treatment and services. How do you care for MRSA in the home? How do you care for active TB and TB in the home are some examples. They consult with other physicians throughout the community. They helped us analyze our data for our surveillance. They developed a very robust surveillance program. They help us monitor our community trends and they help us with forecasting of what we should be prepared for. Um, there are medical li liaison to other um, community leaders and physician leaders throughout the community. But their big, another big part is their focus on our employee and our patient safety. They really help us with maintaining our OSHA standards and we're invaluable for um, advising for us for how do we keep our employees safe, caring for active COVID in the home. When COVID hit, VNA was ready. The initial guidance was for home care staff to wear surgical masks when caring for patients with active COVID, COVID in the home. Absolutely, our medical director says, we can't do that. This is active TB. And uh, that is when our current medical director, Dr. Ashraf, demanded that we use the same PPE that we would use in acute care. We continued the practice of asking our patients to open their window one hour prior to our arrival. This really stems back from the Spanish flu and the TB eras, and we've continued that practice to reduce the germ load in the air. Our patients are using antennaspirometers, they're doing nebulizer treatments, 
they're doing aerosol treatments in the home. And imagine two to three individuals in that home, all COVID positive. Imagine the air load of um, COVID in the air when we arrive in their homes. The shelter nurses were kept from entering the shelters until a solid safety plan was put into place and our nurses could, could um, go back into the shelters. They helped us develop a very important procedure for doffing on a windy day. You don't think about that in a, when we're in a hospital or facility, but I'll, later on I'll tell you a little story about um, why we developed that policy. They also recommended, Dr. Ashraf also recommended we move from our CDC hand washing procedure to the World Health Organization procedure that actually was done prior to COVID so we could really do very solid hand hygiene covering all um, portions of the hands and that was actually a blessing in disguise. Many of our patients lose, they're the first to lose resources. Our patients are referred by our local VNA doctors when really they have limited benef um, benefits and resources. Our infection control medical director is critical to uh, helping keep these individuals who are very vulnerable, keeping them safe in our community. There are community health considerations um, in preventing um, the spread of COVID in the community and in the home. Very solid health announcements um, for performing hand hygiene and performing that often, creating a social distance of six feet or greater, wearing a mask, staying home when sick, and daily cleaning of high touch surfaces. But those of us who work in the home environment know that these are challenging in the home-like setting. Keeping hands clean at home is very hard work. Imagine a mother with three to four children trying to keep their hands as well as her own clean. Homes are not built for social distancing. It's, dis it's very difficult to socially distance in a one bedroom apartment, a shelter, a multi-generational home or a multi-family home, which many of our uh, community members um, live in. Masks go off once they come home. Many cannot stay home when they're sick. Many um, of these individuals are essential workers. They do very important jobs in our community. And so to ask them to stay home when they're sick is a very difficult thing to do. Daily cleaning of high touch surfaces rarely happens. We recognize that and it's very difficult for a family to maintain that daily um, cleaning we are happy with a weekly cleaning, and actually we um, are happy with the baby steps instead of perfection. And the webinar, the second webinar a series of this two-part series will go into a deeper understanding of why we believe there needs to be a greater focus on health literacy and why we really need to focus on what is realistic in the home setting. The third thing that when you, I'll be talking about a little bit later is how do we provide protective um, barriers for family members who care for ill members in the home? Preventing transmission of COVID in the patient community. What we know from the experts is individuals need to be quarantined if they have a significant exposure or if they're um, COVID positive. When the pandemic hit, it hit the low income and minorities hard. Many are essential workers who have important roles, like I said, Packing plants, factories, long-term care facilities, construction workers are a few that have hit our community. They do not have the option to work remotely or do they have the option to work from home. The other important piece is if the caregiving status in the home changes, for like when the caregiver, the main caregiver becomes ill, that is very traumatic for that family. Who's gonna then now, make sure everybody is following the guidelines, making sure everybody's washing their hands and following those guidelines. Other two issues are asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic community members, just as a big challenge as we know. Initially, the large gatherings were a very big concern, but we knew early on in home care that it's those small family gatherings that could be a problem too, and we're beginning to see that in our community. So limiting errands, wearing a mask, socially distancing, 
using hand sanitizer when out of the home, using soap and water when they return, using clean towels to dry our hands are very important measures, but they're often difficult to manage. When an individual is positive in the home, we have to look at preventing transmission to other family members. What we know from experts is to create a separate living space for the sick person. Have that sick person um, use furnishings that can be cleaned and disinfected easily. Need to keep their, their items separate. Um, if they have, do not have uh, ability to share bathrooms or have their own bathroom and they have to share, it's important that the individuals without COVID bathe first and then the COVID positive person they second, and then cleaning that bathroom afterwards. If the caregiver must help that ill person, which often happens, what barriers are they going to use to protect themselves? They don't have face shields. They don't have gowns. Uh, they might have rubber gloves they have in the home. Um, so that's one thing that we noticed immediately. Also tossing gloves after toileting and after eating um, many cannot afford those gloves, and most often it's just using bare hands. Other um, advices or other um, guidelines is eating, eating the meals separately. That can be done. Many of the sick individuals do eat meals separately in their bedroom. Um, their family members, um, many that can wear gloves, prepare their meals, do take it to the room, and there's processes that we can carefully help them with, um, but that is even a challenge for families with um, multiple people in the home. Laundry is a big issue. Um, it's important to wear gloves when doing laundry. Do not shake the laundry because you can make COVID airborne. Wash and dry the laundry. So when we look at our community members that live in apartments that share laundry facilities, that brings an extra challenge. Another recommendation is to clean and disinfect hampers. I'm just glad to see the bottom of my hamper and to disinfect it after each use um, is, would be something new. Performing hand hygiene after laundry is very important because of the transfer of, of germs during the laundering process. And we know that um, COVID can live on surfaces uh, for several days. High touch areas within the home include such things as tables, doorknobs, light switches, handles, toilets, but it also includes faucets, sinks, and electronics, and that coveted TV remote. A disinfectant would not be effective also if uh, the surfaces are soiled. So we need to teach um, individuals to um, first wash that area with soap and water and then disinfect for that disinfectant to be um, effective. Another issue are pets in the home, and I talked a little bit about that, but we have heard um, some pets that have picked, uh, contracted COVID. We do know that animals can pick up human diseases. Um, and so I, I posted there a link to the website for the CDC, which gives some very good information on uh, protecting yourself. But the individual with COVID should really restrict the interaction with their household pet. They should wear masks and use good hand hygiene when interacting with their pets. We learned this the hard way through here at VNA with a very small um, Clostridia dif uh, difficile um, outbreak. It was very small, but we had a kitty who is now on my matrixing list who did come down with C. diff, um, both kitty and the patient survived well but it just shows you how serious um, it could be when you have animals in the home along with humans who are sick. Repair services such as plumbers, electricians, it's very important to protect your home when these repair service workers come into your home. And in our community, they're very friendly, very warm. They're part of our community, but just to recognize that they have been in other homes in that community. Um, we have to screen for them. Have they been exposed to COVID? Is there anybody in their family or their work environment positive? Have they been tested within 14 days? Are some very honest questions we should be able to ask. Also, we cannot 
be shy to demand that they wear a face mask or perform hand hygiene. You can ask them to wear gloves and shoe coverings to protect your home. Food and grocery is very important. We have curbside pickup and delivery services, and there are very safe procedures that are put into place. For some families, however, planning and pre-ordering food to pick up at the curbside is a challenge. Many do not have electronic uh, services that they can you know, email their orders. They, um, many just have use of phones. And finally, package delivery services. They've also, our um, services have also put some safety measures into place, which has been very helpful. But what we teach our family members is to wash your hands before and after handling those packages, and maybe considering allow that package to sit for 24 hours before opening. It's very important when interaction is necessary, always request that they wear a mask. Considerations for home care workers providing care in the home. We've learned that, and it was part of the um, guidelines, very important guidelines to um, pre-visit screening was very important for our staff prior to making any of our patient visits. So we do 100% pre-visit screening for any of our visits. We can have up to between 8,000 and 10,000 visits a month. So that's quite a few screening that we um, do for our uh, employee safety. But what we also learn is this is also challenging. And um, it is the pre-screening visit that um, wasn't done adequate that has um, that is resulted in the exposures that we'll, I'll talk about later on. What the families tell us and what we see in the home is often quite different. One brief, quick example is uh, a single mother was going to be discharged from the home, uh, from the hospital to the home. She said she had a 19-year-old and a four-year-old child at home, and that's what the discharge planning was uh, centered around. When we arrived in the home, there was another 20-year-old, 21-year-old resident, or relative, excuse me, and their, her one-year-old daughter also living in the home. Everyone was coughing, most like everyone was positive for COVID. The mother was very weak and really was the head of the household, but could not function as the head of the household uh, at that moment. So it was a 19-year-old that had to be put in charge. So that visit turned into a safety visit of can this 19-year-old care for that one-year-old child because the 21-year-old was going to work and the four-year-old along with the mother who really needed 24-7 support at that time. We also I spoke about the nebulizer treatments, the aerosolizing treatments that are done in the home. We coordinate and um, need to coordinate our visits around those treatments, wanting to be outside that three-hour window. There are times we know that we cannot, but it's our staff that need to be aware of when they're walking into that heavy um, germ air load in the patient's home. Some of the questions that we needed to add to our screening tool is who was the person in the home that we spoke with? Um, one quick example is we had a daughter that we were calling in Lincoln and we were making the visit in Omaha and the daughter really didn't know uh, who was in the home and that was one of our exposures to our employee. The second one is who will be present when I enter that home? That was another one of our exposures to our staff um, not sure who is going to be in that home. That is still an ongoing issue, but that is a new question we've asked, which has really helped. And the, the other question is, have anyone in your household tested for COVID-19 within the past, past 14 days? What we have found is that families do not openly offer this. They don't think about it. They know that they've tested, but they feel fine, or they're getting over their symptoms, and they're not, no longer worried about it. But to protect our staff, we need to be aware of that. Families need education and demonstration on key infection control principles and protective measures in the home. What we do in home care is we teach, teach, and we teach again. We use a process called Teach Back to really make sure that they understand it. We need to, what we've learned is that family members and many of our community members do not know what high touch services are. We need to demonstrate that. We need to point it out. We need to show them where are those high-touch surfaces. 
and we know that daily cleaning rarely occurs, um, we can accept that, but how do we keep that home safe for that family? We also need to reinforce when and how to perform hand hygiene. Although our nursing and our physical therapy team do a great deal of teaching, what we found is that our occupational therapist and our home health care aides really play a critical role. They're the ones doing the bathing, helping with the toileting, teaching them, teaching family members how to care for those patients safely, how the patient can take care of themselves safely. So they're in very intensely involved in the, the training of, and um, obser observation of the safety techniques within that family. Recovering from COVID-19, the patients can become very deconditioned, requiring much family support. Family members are exhausted. What we also know, what is taught in the facilities is forgotten by the time they get home. So that discharge planning, that great discharge planning, um, just to recognize that many, much of that that is taught is forgotten once they've come home. They come to home to us mostly as a blank slate. Early on, VNA received phone calls from community members saying that our nurses were not washing their hands. What we really found is that we weren't using soap and water. We were using our hand sanitizers. So what we implemented is using soap and water and we use that as a teaching opportunity that really gave a great comfort to our community because what they were hearing was that they were to use soap and water. That was the guidelines and use hand sanitizer only as needed. Um, teaching the patient to manage their personal items is very important and teaching the family how to manage them for them is important, but for them to recognize that touching those items is a potential um, transfer of the COVID. We also had to monitor the trash. What we found is that family members, patients were digging in the trash, pulling out our masks, our gowns, our gloves once we left because they were fearful that they would never be able to obtain any. We ask how old is their toothbrush? If it's the same toothbrush that they were using prior to going into the hospital with COVID, we ask them to get a new one and we toss that one. Same with uh, unused bar, used bar um, soaps left in the bathrooms. That's another um, item that we ask them to toss and to get a new, um, new soaps. We ask them to disinfect their incentive spirometers. We place nebulizer tubings, oxygen tubings that they come home from the hospital with and nursing homes. And um, that's just a common thing that we in home care have done for quite a while. Other considerations for home care workers providing care in the home um, that we need to just consider, it's critical to know who that family caregiver will be. Family members will say that yes, they can care for them, they'll be there for them. But what we often find is that individual coming home from the hospital or skilled facility uh, recovering from COVID need 24 seven um, support. Often these caregivers may not be available. And that's a lot of what we do is help that family put a uh, caregiving team together. Caregivers have a limited understanding of their family members needs and the amount of work that is required to help them recover. Many burn out quickly and expect that their family members should recover sooner than what they do. They don't really realize how much time involvement that it will take to provide safe care in the home. The other piece we talked about, do family members have access to protective equipment if they need it? Some of the creative solutions that we've heard about, um, individuals have worn large men's extra large shirts and worn them backwards. These are the polyester co cotton blend that are thicker um, to function as a barrier. They use large plastic garbage bags to protect them from water splashes at bathing. I've heard about homemade face shields and I actually saw one which was made out of a plastic paper protector and a headband. And also the use of kitchen rubber gloves to use um, for bathing and, and other such you know, personal care for their loved one. Our family members in the home do not have quick, easy access to PPE. Masks have become uh, something that is easily more accessible, but when we're really looking at protecting caregivers in the home and individuals who may be 
essential workers in nursing homes, um, they do need that protective gear to care for uh, their loved ones. Also, what is the relationship with their neighbors when they get home? Do they frequently just drop by? Do the neighbors know that this home maybe have COVID positive um, family members? Is there someone that can help in case there's an emergency? Or is there a risk for that family to become ostracized by that neighborhood? We do see that, especially with our elder community. And so we need to be very careful and very um, intent about understanding the impact uh, of that neighborhood to a positive member recovering in their home. We need to be an advocate for the vulnerable populations. We're often hearing from family members um, about other people in the community who are at risk. So our healthcare workers really need uh, to become experts in identifying, knowing where to turn to for community resources, and also to know that the advocacy role is very important. What if a home is a shelter or multiple friends' homes? Communal living remains a challenge. Um, one of the first things in the shelters, we needed to create a quarantine section that is not always possible in a multifamily or a multi-generational home. Many shelter staff members have become exposed. Visitors come in and out of homes. So there's a lot of variables happening. Um, the other piece I want to talk about briefly, because the other hat I wear is the I'm a hospice copy. Um, support. And our hospice patients living at home um, are extremely, are especially vulnerable, but so is the caregiver and the healthcare worker caring for them. Uh, many patients, many families want to take their, bring their home, their loved one home from facilities so they can spend time with their loved one while in the home. Also, they just want to be home and be among their family. During that period, when the the hospice patient is being cared for in the home. Many families or family members are traveling from out of state. So this is when they have a lot of new people coming in and out of that home, visiting that loved one. During a time of um, visit, at a time of death, um, what we've had to do was we had to uh, make sure that all of uh, We did move to fit testing and training our entire hospice team on our COVID court um, team, um, just so that they can be ready for those moments that, uh, that they need to bump up to the higher level PPE. Now, moving out, we are on the next slide, which is great, keeping healthcare workers um, safe while at home. Um, we did create a COVID core team. We have about 60 members on that team. Um, and we needed to do that to better manage our PPE we were going to run out of our PPE very quickly if we did not get some control of the PPE. And also this core team, we were allowed, allowed us to create um, a group of experts um, that we could really um, train and then intensely um, understand what COVID is all about. We've had to add another donning and doffing procedure and that is competencies for our facilities in yellow and red zones. And this is when our facilities are experiencing some COVID in their facilities. It allows us to support our long-term care facilities, as well as allow our staff to go into those homes and facilities when needed. Um, the practice of daily healthcare worker screen, uh, screening is also critical. That are some of the challenges that we are now continuing to work on. Um, some of our patient exposures, potential patient exposures, have been staff working with um, mild symptoms such as they think there's allergy symptoms. And just this week, an individual came to work once, I just have a cold, it's just minor. She had a runny nose, congestion, and a cough. And so we are continually teaching even our own staff um, the importance of these symptoms. And um, we, needed, need to, we needed to develop very clear work exclusion guidelines that everybody could understand. And what we're finding is that we need to pull back and re-educate and retrain everybody on what this means. Some of the things we've experienced, staff are gonna, now they don't have any more PDO to use. So they're fearful of calling in sick or a manager saying, I just have nobody to fill that shift. Now, what can I do? 
And yes, we've had to go into the crisis um, staffing management, but um, this is something that uh, even in home care, we do have to, to manage. The other piece for home care that we came pretty apparent to us are the guidelines between um, the exposed healthcare worker and the public health community exposures. Because we work in the community, it's difficult to know when we should use what. It's becoming clear, but um, that is still a challenge that we look at for every potential exposure that we experience. And um, that is just something to think about that there's two type of guidelines. Um, we work with both of those. We also have ongoing support for our healthcare workers. We have weekly newsletters from our, actually letters from our CEO, their email letters, which are very important. Staff are looking forward to those weekly letters from our CEO. Those letters really help to keep everybody engaged. COVID fatigue is real. And um, also it's just in time information because we know that change things are changing in our community so rapidly. It really gives that um, weekly guidance for our staff to keep them going and understand what their priorities need to be. We've had full staff meetings with nearly upwards to 300 individuals where leadership could meet with them, these are by Zoom, meet with them, answer questions, and our infection control uh, physician, Dr. Ashraf, also was able to join and answer questions. That was an important support for our healthcare workers. One thing it is, is especially important to think about is to provide a safe space for those individuals who may be caring for loved ones at home. Um, for our facility, it is myself and our HR director who take those calls. But these are individuals who say, I'm the one giving my grandmother a bath and now she's symptomatic. How do I protect myself at home? And this is what we're also finding is um, an opportunity that we need to look at is that healthcare worker is often that healthcare provider for that family. Um, one of the other exposures um, that I'm aware of is a granddaughter who is a, who is a home health aide in a facility also was the one to bathe the, the grandmother. And that's really an honor in that, that home and that family but uh, the risk that that individual um, had was huge because grandmother did develop symptoms and then did expose uh, the facility. So um, focusing on how do we care for that healthcare worker who's also a caregiver at home is especially important. Just to give you just a brief um, description of our positivity experience, all of our healthcare workers who had exposures resulting in a confirmed COVID positive test can be traced back to ineffective pre-screening visits. And we've had three. 100% of our hospice team, like I said, are now fit tested and are provided face shields and full PPE and they're fully trained. And that has um, reduced dramatically the amount of exposures in that um, service. Patient exposures all related to employees were all related to mild symptoms, believing that these symptoms were not um, COVID. From March 20th or 2020 to October, we've had a total of um, 14 clinicians test positive, three were work related, and the remaining 11 were all community related. So community um, spread and community exposure is still very important. Um, that's all I have for the slides. Um, if there's any questions, and I think Kate has some information to share also. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Judy. Um, that, that was great information. It was a lot of information to take in. And um, I just want to really, really thank you very much for um, informing us with all that. It was, it was really nice hearing all of that. Great. Um, so, but anyway, before we move on to questions, um, I'd, I'd like to mention that um, Dr. Ryan Fagan from the CDC, he had hoped to be on the webinar to discuss some of the CDC's resources um, on this topic. 
Um, but of course, um, he is very, very busy as a, I'm sure you're aware that everybody at the CDC is at this moment. So unfortunately, he, he couldn't make it. So I'll just make a mention on behalf of all the hard work that's being done at the CDC. So as you can see from the list on the screen, some of the links, um, these are the ones that are available at cdc.gov. Um, I think it's really important to say that although they may not relate directly to community health, the guidance is translatable for every user group. So I wanna encourage all of you to take advantage of that information that's freely available for all of us. So, so now we're gonna get on to um, some of your questions uh, that we have here. And so, um, so some of the questions will require a much bigger answer and may require Judy to um, maybe put some links and resources um, on our NETEC um, repository for you. Um, but maybe just briefly, you know, give some advice on these questions here, Judy. Um, what, if anything, should I do if I have a family member die at home? And, and I'm assuming that that would be from COVID. That's a very good question. Yes, I can hear you, Kate. Um, and if a loved one has died at home and they're not on hospice, you do have to get your local um, 911 involved and they can help direct. Uh, of course, that, that you do need to take care of. The hospice team will help coordinate that for you if they're on hospice. But if you're talking about cleaning the home, um, what you need to do, it's the same. You will need to continue to um, clean and manage that home for the next 72 hours or more, cleaning those surfaces, being very careful with the bedding and the laundry, um, um, because, you know, COVID does live on surfaces for uh, several days. I hope that answered the yeah. question. Yep. Yeah, I hope so. If not, then, you know, maybe the, um, the person can contact us and ask for more information on that. Um, another question here, does your staff wear N95s for all visits? Our staff do not. Um, majority of our visits are made with, of course, our health grade um, surgical mask, and we, of course, wear eye protection. Um, our N95s are used for, of course, our COVID positive patients and our COVID monitoring, those who have been exposed and we are um, the, who potentially could convert to positive. And also in our facilities, when our facilities have experienced COVID and they're calling them yellow zones and red zones, but um, we walk into the facilities with an N95 at that particular moment. Also for our patients who are um, choosing not to wear face masks with that universal masking, um, we do an assessment of the risk, but we most likely will uh, use an N95 during those visits also. Okay. Um, another question here. Um, if, if my partner is ill um, and confirmed to have COVID and we've taken all these precautions, um, after he recovers, how long should we wait before returning to normal and sharing our bedroom, bathroom? That's a very good question. Um, what we have done here at the um, VNA is the CDC guidelines that say that a person, an individual can recover within those 10 days, 10 days from the onset of symptoms or 10 days from the positive test, if they're basically healthy. We've added an additional four days after that for the full 14 because of that surface cleaning. Okay. And that is where when you would really want to change the bedding Make sure that the bathrooms, every, all the surfaces are clean. The floor is um, shampooed, the carpet is shampooed, the floor is cleaned, all the surfaces are wiped down. And um, that four day really allows that COVID to die. Um, and so there's a lot less um, live COVID on surfaces after the fourth day. Okay, um, Judy, Judy, do you um, recommend that when people do this disinfection that they wear a mask, for example, or any other PPE? Mm -hmm. um, the EPA approved, Environmental Protection Agency has approved multiple products that we can use. And we follow those uh, manufacturer guidelines. Some do require masks, face masks. 
Most all require gloves to be worn. Um, and that is an important thing to recognize. Um, so I cannot just do a blatant recommendation of use a mask or use gloves, but for sure to use gloves. Um, and then read the, read the back of that um, cleaner or disinfectant to see what other protective measures you need to use. Okay. Um, th this uh, participant wanted to know, what are your exclusion criteria and how do you make the determination? I'm assuming that's exclusion from work. Um, our exclusion criteria is, and then CDC updated their guidelines to what an exposure means. And an exposure means um, 15 minutes over a, of less than six feet together out in the community, it doesn't matter if you're wearing a mask or not, but in a work uh, related, in a health work related environment is if you're not wearing your appropriate PPE, um, we do have our staff stay home for 14 days if they fall in, into that exposure category of more than 15 minutes, not maintaining that six feet and not wearing the proper um, PPE. Okay. Um. Now, now, somebody here, they said they, they lost sound when we were talking about the needs that, uh, that need to be done for uh, COVID patient deceased. But, um, I think we answered that question. Um, another thing that just came to mind was that, you know, we had our little um, technical hiccup uh, a little bit ago. And it's when you were talking about hospice and taking care of a hospice patient in the home. Would you be able to just briefly recap what you were going to say or what you did say that none of us could hear? Oh yes, that was that was an important one. Um, the reason why our hospice team is fully um, COVID trained now is because of the death visit, um, caring for patients in the home when the loved one dies. That we have identified as a very high risk situation. Our, um, we do make visits at that time, um, hopefully before the patient um, does pass. But um, when we arrive, it could just be a few family members at that time. But what we realize is once we're focusing on the patient and um, while we're there with the family, within a few minutes, it can soon be ballooned to 20 people in the home, all crying, not wearing masks, mm. uh, no social distancing, and that's grief. That is the response to grief. And that is not, now is not the time for us to say, maintain social distance, wear your mask, because it's just not possible. But that is a time of great exposure um, for that family. We're aware of that. We know that funerals can be a big part of uh, exposure also. What we have done from our uh, staff is to allow them to wear the N95 face shields and all the protective um, gear that they need to when going into that home. Okay. Um, so we did get a little bit of clarification on that question, Judy. Um, by exclusion, she um, meant exclusion or being exempt uh, from caring from a COVID patient. Well, that's a good, that's a very good um, question also. Um, we, that's what we, when we created the COVID core team, we asked for volunteers and we were very fortunate to have a large group just come forward. We've had to outreach and add to that team and for members who um, did not volunteer. And that's when my training comes in to really help them feel more comfortable. And one of the positives is, is that COVID core team receives the full PPE. None of our COVID core team have been at risk when wearing the full PPE and when doing that proper screening. So we know we have a very solid, effective PPE and donning and doffing process. We use the med centers and NETEX guidance on that and um, of course, Dr. Ashraf's recommendation to use that higher level donning and doffing, and it's been very successful. The other exclusions are those individuals, and we do have family, uh, pay, excuse me, clinicians who have their own comorbidities, their own illnesses that really um, should exempt them from caring for COVID positive patients. Our managers work directly with them, our human resources, know that uh, human resources and myself um, are aware of that. We do protect their, um, their personal um, medical information, but um, 
no any nobody with a um, health condition that might put them at risk would be forced to care for um, active COVID or COVID monitoring patients. Awesome. Um, there were, a lot of great information has been shared this afternoon. Um, one person has asked, could you share any of your guidance documents for donning and doffing PPE during inclement weather? Oh, I would be happy to. I can um, I can talk about it and I can also share if you want to email or um, give us your um, uh, communication I can or contact information. I will get that to you. But um, the situation that happened was our, our nurse went into the patient's home. She was expecting a husband who was the patient and a wife who was recovering from COVID. When she entered the home, uh, there were four positive adults and three positive um, teenagers living in that home. So she was overwhelmed. They were not able to open the window because the windows were painted shut. It was an older home. So all she could think about was leaving that home and to, to doff that PPE and just so she could just take that breather. It was her first COVID experience. It was the windiest day of the spring. She opened the door, stepped out the door and her gown flipped up and over her, covering her head and her face. So that's when we knew we needed to do something different. Uh, we were actually able to find um, a procedure that a home care used um, on the uh, West Coast, and we were able to adopt that to our practices. And now on any type of increment weather or windy day, our staff do doff and remove that PPE right inside the home, close to the door that they're gonna exit. We ask family members to leave the room if the patient's not able to leave the room, we make sure that they're six to 10 feet away. And then we will doff our gown. We do our booties in the home. We doff our booties and um, items in the home and then we could safely exit. Great. So, so, so you partially answered to the next question here, Judy. Um, somebody has just typed in uh, that there's been talk um, about how people can transfer COVID through shoes. Um, what is your take on it? And I, I guess maybe talk about why you're using booties. Very good question. Um, the the guidance which sorry, um, the guidance that we were seeing says you don't need head covers and you don't need booties. But working in home care, we know we need booties. We need booties on a routine day because of pets in the home. But we also know that environmental service isn't coming through vacuuming or cleaning every day. And so um, members on our COVID core team also had young children. They recommended from the very beginning, can we please have booties? And we said, of course. Our leadership said, of course. So we added that to our um, program. The other one was the head covers. What we realized is, of course, the young mothers that were also caring for COVID also had young children were worried about, what if I can't shower before I pick up my child? What can I do? Because in the home setting, think about those seven positive individuals in that small home. All they could think about was COVID on their hair. On, you know. And so the other piece is the surgical caps that our staff wear they're covering a larger portion. They're covering their ears, covering almost their full forehead down to their neck. And we have a much more protection with that head cover. And also our shoes are also protected um, from any potential exposure of COVID that might be on the floors or carpet. Thanks, Judy. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would say, again, this, this has been a great webinar. Lots and lots of great information. And um, I just want to say that, you know, that there is a, a part two to this webinar, and that is going to be next Friday. And uh, I've seen some of the content that is already being developed for it. And I can assure you, you won't be you know, disappointed if you tune in again next Friday to um, hear part two of this great session. Okay, so one thing I want to do is just... Um, reiterate that NETEC is here to help. Um, if you have any questions, any questions whatsoever, um, please email them to info at NETEC.org. They will be answered by NETEC SMEs as soon as possible. Um, and if you do want to have some technical assistance, you can also uh, put that request in at NETEC.org. Next slide, please.
Um, we do um, a lot of um, put out a lot of information on social media. Um, so, you know, you can go to our website, you can, you know, check out our repository, you can email us, but you can also find us on Facebook, um, on um, Twitter, on we have a Neetech blog, and, and we also have um, Instagram account. So, so please, you know, check us out on social media. So again, thank you so very much for attending this webinar. It was definitely a pleasure to have Judy um, come in and give us all her information from her experience. And um, again, we'll look forward to part two of this webinar series next Friday. Thank you.